This video will look at the MIS-P ritual, starting with an overview of what the ritual involved. We will discuss the primary material as well as anthropological approaches using Hinduism, Hare Krishna and Christianity. MIS-P is a washing of the mouth ritual and incantation series for the cult induction of a new divine idol. This ritual can be split into two parts, carried out over two days. Firstly, Miss P, meaning mouth washing, where the statues are purified from human contamination, followed by Pit P, meaning mouth opening, which brings the statue to life and enables it to function like a deity, allowing the gods to taste and hear. By the end of the ritual, the idol does not just represent the god, it completely manifests the god. The Miss P ritual secures cosmic stability for the Assyrians. The first part of the ritual is the preliminal stage. This is when the statue is isolated from the temple and the craftsman who made it in order to sever any ties with the fact that the statues were man-made, but were actually made by the gods themselves. The lamentation priest uncovers his head, beats his breast and cries, woe. This is followed by the liminal stage, which is intended to imbue life into the figure by dressing the statue and blessing it with water. A concoction made from ghee, honey, cedar and cyrus resin was applied to the mouth and nose so the statue could taste food and smell incense while the Masusu priest recites the incantation on the day when the god was created. The statue then has to be transported to the temple. It must be kept pure on the journey, meaning the liminal or purification stage may have to be repeated. It is likely that makeshift reed huts may have been erected near the river banks to carry out this process again during transportation. During the period between taking down the old statue and the arrival of the new one, a state of lamentation existed while everyone was unprotected. A priest would declare ritual mourning where everyone would cry, rip their clothes, cover themselves in ash and lacerate themselves in order to scare away bad spirits. If the old statue was too damaged to be repaired, it would be wrapped in a cloth with precious metals and stored for later use. The loss of the statue was mourned like the loss of a human life. The ritual ends when the statue is placed in the temple and the bricks of the goddess Balatili, the goddess of childbirth, are libated and placed before the statue. The goddess acts as a kind of midwife to the god giving birth to themselves. The statue is now a living and breathing god. We do not have many surviving texts in full and so rely on the few fragments we have. There are two main sources for the Miss P ritual that show two traditions a version from Nineveh and one from Babylon. The Tabla of Shamash, 860 to 850 BCE, depicts Nabu Aplu Adina being taken to the sun god Shamash by a priest Nabu Nadin Shum and goddess Ah. Shamash is seated before a sun disk on an altar which is held up by ropes and other deities who spring from the shrine. Mesopotamians believe that the deity resided in many forms simultaneously, whether this be as an anthropomorphic figure, symbol, material, or even number. The inscription on the obverse and reverse Nabu Aplu Zadina's re-endowment of the Sun Temple at Sippar, about 43 miles north of Babylon. Part of the inscription hints towards the crafting of the idol statues and mentions briefly the existence of the Miss P and Pit P mouth washing and opening rituals. We know from the Nineveh and Babylon tablets that the mouth washing and opening happened multiple times across various locations as the statue is led from the workshop to the temple. This represents the deity moving from the danger of the steps to the ordered safety of the temple. Hundley argues that each washing and opening made the statue purer so it was ready to meet the gods who would then accept it into the divine community and enliven the statue with the deity's spirit. Tabla IM124645 from the Sipar Library gives us an incantation used in the Miss P ritual, as quoted by Al Rawi and George, 1995, pages 226 to 228. Here are some quotes from the tablet. I am the chief purification priest of the sacred rites of Eridu. I have cast water down and purified the ground for you. I have set down pure thrones for you to sit on. I have presented you with clean red robes. This illustrates the importance of purification in the ritual and the primary sources. The statue must be pure to be enlivened. SAA 03044 comes from a series of so-called letters from the gods. The line, I commissioned you to renew those gods 
and to provide for their shrines, illustrates how the ancient Mesopotamians believed the cult statues were created by the gods, working through the king, craftsmen, and priests. This idea is enforced through the use of the tamarisk dagger that the craftsmen used to symbolically cut off their hands, as seen in the Babylonian text. By symbolically cutting off the hands of the craftsmen, and have them remove themselves from the crafting process, the Assyrians allowed the statues to be divine and divinely made. This counters the argument in Isaiah, which mocks idol statues as seen here. With whom, then, will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? As for an idol, a metal worker casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold, and fashions silver chains for it. So how can something man-made be divine? Because it is not man-made, the gods make the statue. There have been some suggestions that the statue itself is made by the divinity who resides there. Through believing this, the Assyrians counter the argument in Isaiah. Murti translates to embodiment. It is not itself the god, instead a shape or manifestation of one. There are different types of Murti, like Raudra or Urga, forms that are used to induce fear. We also have Shanta and Sumia, which do the opposite by expressing peace, love and compassion. In ancient Assyria, we also see gods depicted as both intimidating, as seen here with Ashur and his bow, and also seen with Nisroch, god of agriculture, peacefully fertilising his crops. Amurti, they're more for practicality of worship as opposed to Assyrians, needing them for protection and a literal godly presence. This passage from the Bhagavad Gita suggests that their use for statues aren't as intense as the Assyrians. It is much more difficult to focus on God as the unmanifested than God with form, due to human beings having the need to perceive via the senses. So when a person worships a murti, it is assumed to be a manifestation of the essence or spirit of the deity. This suggests that it's easier to dedicate time and focus on spirituality through anthropomorphic or non-anthropomorphic icons. Although this would have been a role for the Assyrians, there seems to be a lot more emphasis on the statue as a living deity, as opposed to the Hindu's idea that it's a symbolic representation to aid prayer. This can be seen in the washing of the mouth ceremony and incantations. Salmu is an image of a god or a king, for example, but the depiction has a distinct unreality behind it. It is better understood as a form of interpretation behind the everyday world. You can see gods being depicted symbolically. Here we have the sun disk, which is Ashur. The symbolism can be seen behind Hindu depictions of gods. Shiva has a third eye to show wisdom. Vishnu has four arms, each holding something with a symbolic significance. There are not only similarities in statues, but also their concepts of divinity. Both are polytheistic, with different gods representing different abilities. Whilst Christianity specifically forbids idolatry, as there is a belief that statues made by humans are just that, and that, that gods do not inhabit them, there are many overlapping beliefs held by modern Christians to those in the Mispi ritual. The weekly Eucharist is the most obvious comparison. In this ritual, a priest can take a piece of bread and wine, which has been made by humans, and literally turn it into the flesh and blood of Christ, who is one and the same as God. This would seem an identical belief to the Miss P ritual, which allows a priest to take a statue which has been made by man and turn it to the place where a god resides. Both produce a physical god from human labour. The interesting point to make here is that despite Catholic doctrine stating that bread and wine literally becomes the body of Christ, it is debated amongst believers who don't all believe in transubstantiation, despite teaching and the tradition of kneeling or bowing before the tabernacle is not that commonly observed anymore. The belief that bread and wine is the body of God has also caused splits within the Christian church and is a main difference between the Catholic church and the Anglican communion. Despite idolatry being specifically banned in the Bible, practices similar to this still exist in the Catholic church with the papal sanctioned grotto at Lourdes seeming to represent a worship of idols where pilgrims touch the rock below a statue of Mary. The constant religious rituals which surround these types of statues can be seen by the twice daily masses which are said in front of it. It would probably give us an indication of the care and attention the statues for the Mispi ritual would have also been given in their temples. Anthropology is the study of the human race, especially of its development, customs and beliefs. We will be focusing on a cultural approach here. 
Emile Durkheim's Elementary Forms of Religious Life opens up the arena of anthropological history, but there are arguments over whether anthropological knowledge is made of more historical or scientific knowledge. Cultural anthropology focuses on patterns of thought and behaviour in different societies. Anthropologists take a holistic approach where they demonstrate the relatedness of cultural elements. One of the main components of anthropology is ethnography. Ethnographic study was pushed by Malinowski and Boas in the combination of direct observation and participation to the groups and societies which are being studied. There are two different types of observation, etic and emic. An etic observation is through the lens of the outsider. They may have their own preconceived ideas and will compare and contrast while looking for universal patterns. An emic observation is through the lens of the insider. It can be a member of their own culture who will fully understand their own behaviour and customs. Emic observation will look at one group and examine their uniqueness. Cultural relativism is the study of societies as being qualitatively different from each other. It is the view that all beliefs and customs are relative to the individual group within their own social context. No one has the right to judge whether another society's customs can be seen as right or wrong. Each society has their own inner logic, so it is misleading to rank them on a scale with one another. Cultural anthropologists have devoted considerable attention to analysing religion. The most recent studies have focused on how the religious systems function for both an individual and society as a whole. Using an anthropological approach allows us to see that religion drives, to a variable degree, a lot of human behaviour. It allows us to focus on the study of rituals which incorporate symbols and note how they bring communities together. Using anthropological approaches in historical study can allow for a more focused and direct look at human behaviour and how it is affected by culture and ritual. It allows for the specific objective examination of societies that may have been missed by using a broader historical method. Using this, we can look at underlying patterns and structures beyond the action. <laughs> but there's one person, one spirit, but he takes many forms. So how could he be everywhere and in one place at the same time? The example is given like the sun. So the sun shine. It's everywhere, right? And we say, oh, the sun's up. The sun's in my room. No, the sun's not in your room. You'd burn up if the sun was <laughs> in your room. But it's the sunshine. Still, the sun is in one place, mm. but it's spread through with its energy. So that's the principle. These analogies to help us get into yeah. understand how a person can be in, or, or a form, you know, can be in one place and spread everywhere. And that's what we call sadhana or practices. Yeah. That's what. So part of our sadhana, our daily practices, is worshiping the deity. Part of our daily practices is, is that we chant. You know, we chant a prescribed number of rounds. We can go on our own, it's our own private personal meditation. Mm. If you act, in the, the, they actively will invoke our consciousness. But if we neglect them, just like if we call you, we come to interview and I'm running around and then I turn my back and then fiddle around, you're going to oh, I'm going to go. Isn't it? Mm. Well, that's just natural psychology. Yeah, yeah. It's just natural psychology. Yeah. So why would we invite God in and then take no notice? Yeah. He's going to stay there. He's like, okay, well, you called me. Hello. <laughs> and then we just, it's like, well, you know, I, come on. You know, yeah. and eventually you're going to say, okay, <laughs> you don't want me. <laughs> so that's, it's the same sort of principle. Yeah, so if you're worshipping, he's like, yeah, of course. And, and there's many scriptural quotes that say, but those worshipping my name, that's in the Bible. And God, so whatever, you know, God can appear in any shape or any form. It's said like he appeared, was it to Moses as a burning bush? Mm. He can appear in any, he can use the material and transform that because he's the source of all energy, like I'm saying. So he's the source of everything, just like electricity is the source of the lights and it's how you use it. There's only one source, that's what I was saying. And they were, if they got all, if they did, I guess the same as everything, and eventually, but. Mm. They will be placed maybe in a sacred river, something okay. like that, placed back into the earth. Because that's, that's perfect ecology that comes yeah. from the, see, that's the, that's the system. It's not that you, you know, especially anything sacred, if it, you know, if it runs its course with books or beads or yeah. anything, whatever we use, we try to, the, then it has to be put back in the ground or burned or something. So it's okay. going back, yeah. back, to the, back to the elements where they yeah. come from. They're material elements. It's the material elements that can be then transformed to spiritual. It's just like we can, you, Otherwise, how do we connect? Yeah. How do we connect? We're material and the spiritual. That is so hard. And how do we connect? So we well, we've got to use material things. <laughs>